Heavenly Father, thank you that we can come to you this morning. Thank you that we can give you all the praise and all the glory that you deserve, God. I pray that you would be with us this morning, Father God. I pray for the word that's coming, God. I pray that we can enter your courts with thanksgiving, Father God, no matter what has happened this week, God. We dedicate this morning to you, God, and we praise and we worship your holy name. And your people said, Amen. Amen. We have some announcements this morning. Good morning, church. How are we going? Welcome to church. Glad to welcome you here on this wonderful Sunday morning. Got some announcements. First one up this morning is our Centre for Change Christmas gift. So what we do each year as a church is that we as a church, we're going to bless children in the Philippines at the Centre for Change. And we have some little cards that look like this in the foyer after church. They look like this. And what we do there, each card is worth $25. What we'd ask you to do is that you would buy a card, $25. You can buy one, two, three, four, as many as you want. We have 80 out there after church. We ask that you give so we can bless the Christmas of these children in the Philippines of Center of Change through the work of Margaret Pashley. What you can do is you can take a card and you can, you can direct deposit from your account. And if you do that, all we ask is that you put the number of the card in the description if you can do that so we can keep track of which cards have been bought for, which ones haven't been bought for. But if you want, you can buy them after church using the FPOS machine. You can do that straight after church. Christina will be out there. with will be a big board. You can't miss it. They're all lined up nice and neatly. I measured them exactly so they fit on the board perfectly because I'm a perfectionist, okay? It would drive me insane if they were out. And he's always like, yes, I understand. So I encourage you. Uh, the goal is to raise uh, $2,000. So purchase a gift, purchase a few. I encourage your church, get behind it. Let's bless some children who you never meet and never see, okay, with a wonderful Christmas this year. Also coming up, we have the Christmas Craft afternoon. That's on the 20th of November, between 2 and 5. Bring your own Christmas craft to do. Just a very relaxed time, just chilling out. Men and women are invited. doesn't matter if you like doing craft, you can come along. Please see Alyssa or Chris if you have any more questions. Also coming up, we have Girls with Grace. It's a, a conference about solid living with confidence, purpose, and security for women living on their own. They're having a meet-up on the 27th of November, right here between 2 and 4. And speaking that afternoon will be our own Pastor Pavey bringing a message. So if you have any, any information at all, please see Pastor Pavey, or you can see Anomi, wave Anomi, so people know who you are. You can see Anomi if you want more information. encourage you to get involved. Also, of course, we have our Riverside Community Carols coming up as well on the 11th of December. Okay, so that is our big community event, 11th of December. There's going to be food trucks, there's going to be petting zoo and horse rides and Jumping Castle, all the all, all the bells and whistles, plus carols in the church. We have Carrie Van, opera singer, coming to perform with us, and the Brisbane Gospel Choir coming as well, plus our own band and choir. I really encourage you, it's a huge event. I really encourage you to get involved. So we're still asking for volunteers. There's lots of things that need to be done in the kitchen, parking cars, greeting people, helping serve tea and coffee. Uh, watching over the jumping castle. There's a million things that need to be done. So I encourage you to get involved. If you want to get involved, please come and see me. It'd be great if we can work together and bless our community. But on the night before, on the 10th of December, will be the Christmas carols as well. And that's an event purely for those in the church. You can invite people along if you want to. But we just thought it'd be a great one, a great run through for those performing, but also a way to bless our church. You can come along and just enjoy our good carols night. Okay, be really good if you can uh, come along. And for those who are volunteering the Saturday, it means you get to come along and actually enjoy the carols because on the Saturday, you'll be running around doing lots of different jobs. So on the 10th of December, we're probably going to do it about 7 p.m. Only go for an hour. Gives you time to get home from work and to come along and enjoy carols night right here at the church. And Caravan will be performing that night as well. So 10th of December for the church, but the 11th of December is the big community carols inviting anyone and everyone to come in and we can bless them celebrating the birth of our saviour also encourage you to get connected in connect groups really great way i love going to our connect group each wednesday and of course thank again you church for being so uh, grateful with your giving uh, lots of different ways you can give direct deposit from your account using the machine at the back or you can use the tidely app thank you very much for your giving if you want to keep in track with the church follow our facebook page go on our website go on youtube there's lots of ways to connect and find out more information about what we're doing and advertise and share with your friends and family about what we're doing here at Riverside. So I encourage you to get involved that way. So I'm going to now ask the Power Kids if they're ready to go to Power Kids. So give them a hand as they go out. Thank you, our instructors, our teachers this morning. 
Jackie and Laura, who are going to go out and teach the next generation about Jesus. Thank you so much. Well, this morning, it is my pleasure to invite not only our guitarist, but also our senior pastor. Well, wasn't he good this morning on the guitar? Awesome. I'm going to thank I'm going to invite Pastor Jim to come and share the word this morning. Thank you. thank you, Jim. Thank you so much, Pastor Randall. Thank you for putting up with my guitar playing. I'm a hack, all right? So I'm just filling in. That's not my call. Uh, it's a gift that's been honed out of much pain in our household. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And if you ha- are a guitarist and like to play in the band, please come and see me and then you can certainly replace me instantly. That would be good. Amen. Okay. Why don't we stand up? Come on. I feel like some energy's in the house this morning. Oh, look at you getting up. Some of you go, do we have to stand up? All right, put your hands in the air. All right, put your hands out like that. Turn to the person nearest to you and say, you don't have a mask on. <laughs> woo You don't have a mask on. Freedom. This is what William Wallace was talking about, folks. Freedom. All right, sit down. That's good. You're looking good. You, you look better without a mask on. Amen. Well, this morning we are continuing in the book of John. You have had some amazing preaching the last three weeks. Pastor Randall, Pastor Ken, uh, we are very blessed in our church to have great preachers. You only have to go somewhere else, honestly, and you know, Man, I I feel very honoured to uh, have such great preachers in our church. And we're all different. We all complement each other. We don't compete with each other. This is not a house of competition. This is a house of completion. We're being completed for the glory of God. Amen? Amen? So, who would like to be blessed this morning? Oh, only half. Okay, fair enough. All right. My dad had this saying when he was asked, how are you? He would say, I'm blessed. Who remembers that? My dad saying that, I'm blessed. And he would say this, blessed are those who believe who have not seen the Lord. And that's a scripture and he always believed being blessed, he was blessed. And so I'm going to start a new tradition and I'm going to say, if you ask me, how are you? I'm better than blessed. That's kind of like double blessing better than blessed. And if you want to receive a blessing this morning, we are going to, re- we're going to read from the Scriptures a blessing that is essential for you in this life. When I was preparing this message and I came to this, this word of blessing, I delved in to have a look and I was absolutely shocked. I was so shocked as the Word of God began to unfold for me concerning this blessing. And I believe that everyone needs this blessing. But we all know that with every blessing or opportunity received, there is always a condition, isn't there? A promise with a condition. So, let's have a look. But we have to keep this in mind, that the Scriptures that we are going to read, it's the last week of Jesus' life. The last week. And he knows he's about to go to the cross last week. And as I read that about that and keep in my mind the last week, I ask myself, what would I tell my children if I had one week to live? What would you tell your children or your loved ones or friends? What would you tell them at work to do? What would you say? What I say to Alex, Alex, this is how you wash the car. Very important. You wet it. You never wash it in the sun because it'll dry all waxy. You soap it all up and then you hose it all off and then you kind of like wipe it all down and then you get the chamois out, you know, and you go inside the door frames, round the back of the boot, and then you spray the tires black. You put armor all on the dash. No. What would you say if it was your last week? I think you would say something like this. These are the values that I have found to be good. This is my experience. This is what I want you to know from life. You would tell them what you truly believed and how important it was to conduct themselves in life because life is short. The book of James tells us that life is like 
uh, our breath that appears on a mirror for a moment and vanishes. And this is exactly what Jesus does in these last few chapters of John. He tells us how to conduct our life. He shows us, he encourages us. He tells us this, not only that we get the most out of life, but that we can reveal what Christ is like. How can people really know about Jesus? You know, our world has become so almost disenfranchised about Jesus, not knowing who He is or what He's done. How will they ever, ever know unless we tell them and unless we show them? Because as a believer in Christ, you are being watched and not by Big Brother, not by the internet, You're being watched by other people to see if what you say matches up with what you do. And that's the challenge of life for us. How can people know Jesus unless we show them, truly show them how to live? So let's read from John chapter 13. And we're going to read from verse 1 to 17. And we're going to read for the first seven verses. Starting John 13, verse 1 to 7. This is what it says. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to the Father. He knew his time had come. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. That's an interesting thought right there. How can the devil prompt someone while they are physically with Jesus? He is with the Son of God, the Son of Man. He who has done miracles, he who has spoken truth, And there, right beside him, I think, maybe, is one who would betray him. Verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist and poured water into the basin. And then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. This was an unusual act for someone who was considered to be a rabbi, someone who was a teacher, to wash his disciples' feet. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. Can I say this to you? This is what I have found. Some days I do not understand what Jesus is doing in my life, but one day, someday, I will. In fact, you may have experienced that already. God, why am I going down this track? It just doesn't seem fair. It's harsh. It's discontinued from kind of like what I had originally planned. Just relax. Just be at peace. He will reveal everything. Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. Often Jesus is going to do things in your life that you will not understand initially, but after you will. And as he's starting to move towards Peter, and Peter goes, not not my rabbi, not my teacher, not my pastor. If I ever come to you and say, can I wash your feet, you'll probably faint. No, Peter protested. You will never wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. And Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and my head as well, not just my feet. Peter has gone from, you're not doing this, Jesus, 
to do it all, Jesus. What an incredible character this guy is. No, no, don't, no, no, no. Uh, and Jesus says, well, if I don't, you can't have any part of it. Well, let's, let's do it all. Do you know anyone who goes from one extreme to another? Don't nudge your wife or your friend next to you. They go from one to another. Maybe you're the Peter. I remember saying, what are you laughing for? I remember saying, we're going we're gonna to fast. Okay, let's fast uh, a meal. And I go, no, no, if we're going to fast, we're going to fast for 21 days on water. I tell you what, there's a little joy bucket coming at that day three with no coffee. An extreme, no, don't wash my hands. I'll wash it all, wash it all. Jesus replied, listen to this. A person who is bathed all over does not need to wash, except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. And that's what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. He's obviously referring to Judas. But Jesus says, a person who has bathed all over, does not need to wash completely except for his feet. And here's the situation, because I would read that for years. I don't, I don't get that. I don't, I don't understand. It was custom, and it should be our custom too, because they're going to a Passover meal. So they're going out for dinner. Can I suggest to you, before you go out for dinner, have a bath, have a shower, wash Brush your teeth, comb your hair, clip your fingernails, smile. That's all Jesus is saying here. But you see, what was happening with them, because they had all washed all over before they went to the Passover. That's just custom. They had to do it. But on their road to going to where they were going, there was dirt and there was dust. And they didn't have on Doc Martens or Jimmy Choo's. They had sandals on their feet. And the dust would go underneath their feet and go on their feet. And so all of this is looking beautiful. But you would come to someone's house and you would go, oh my goodness, can someone get the slave to wash the feet? And that's what they would do. They would have a slave to wash the people's feet before they went in. But for some strange reason, there is no slave. Imagine if it's totally custom and it's your expectation that when you go to someone's place that the slave washes your feet before you go in and you turn up and there's no one. No one at all. You know, in Fiji, we were out in the middle of nowhere and we were having a service and it was fantastic. But we all had sandals on, but we all had to take off our sandals before we went in. And there was like a pile of 30 or 40 sandals. And I'm thinking to myself, I better be the first one out because someone's going to pick up my good looking sandals for sure. (laughs) Some of you know what I'm talking about. But there was supposed to be someone to wash their feet and they get there and there's no one to wash their feet. Oh, that's a bit rude, isn't it? That's what would happen. That's what they would think. That's what they would feel. For some strange reason, there's no slave. But they go in because there's a meal on. Now we know the story because Judas, the betrayer, is in the group. And Jesus begins to wash their feet. Jesus, you've got to think about this, folks. Jesus knew The betrayer was there and was going to betray him and hand him over and he washes his feet. If it was me and I knew that someone was going to betray me, this is what I would do. Oh, please. Papi calls that the insincere smile. Oh, please. Come in, sit down. Let me wash your feet. And I would gently grab the foot and I would go, this little piggy went to market. This little piggy, what happened? This little piggy had roast beef. 
and this little piggy head? No. And this little piggy, <laughs> that's what I would do. All the way home. But Jesus doesn't do that. He does something that is so out of the box. He bends down and he washes his feet and he dries the feet of the betrayer. Wow. Would you do that? Someone said, no. Why did he do that? Why? Why would he do that? Jesus loved him, even though he was going to betray him. Jesus is reaching out to him. He's, he's doing one last plea to him. He's saying, I know what you're going to do. Can you imagine if you were Judas and you're going to betray him and you're looking down at someone that he knows potentially that he's going to be betraying this, this son of man, son of God? I couldn't look him in the eye. Would you look him in the eye? I don't think you would. Why does he do that? Because Jesus is showing us something that is so incredible that we have to really kind of like get over ourselves and do for someone else. Here's the thing. Religions of the world have mankind, men and women, clamoring to get to their God, doing things, sacrificing you know, stripping away all the clothing, trying to get to God. This is the difference between that and our faith. We have a God in heaven who comes to us. We don't go to him. He has come to us. We don't have to do anything to get back into his presence except believe for what he's done for us. Christianity is where God reaches out to man. And he set in motion a plan to bring us back to him. That's the point. Even betrayers, even liars, even cheats, even adulterers. Why? Because you're worth it. You're worth it. Because you're created in the image of God. You know, I have found that a parent, <coughs> excuse me, will... Almost forgive a child anything. Almost forgive a child anything. And I often thought, how? I just don't... How can, the child has taken advantage. The child's not doing the right thing by the parents. The child is bad-mouthing the parents. And I think, how, how can that parent do that? Because you see, part of them is in that child. That's what it is. And you know, part of you is in you, is God. Because God breathed into mankind the breath of life. And he not only breathed into you life, but he created you in his image. And that's why he loves you so much. What do you, what do you think Judas would have done if he came to Jesus and said, Lord, I'm sorry, I betrayed you. What do you think Jesus would have done? I think he would have what? Forgiven him. But I've handed you over. I've given you to them. He would have forgiven him. Because that's what he was about. I know this to be true because Peter denied him. And left him. It's not a lot of difference between those two. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what you're thinking. But there is always a way back to God. Always a way. Don't let the devil and his angels ever tell you that you can't come back to God. It's a lie. He sent his son to die for us because he loves us with an everlasting love. He reaches out to us to forgive us. He reached out and planned from the beginning of the fall of mankind. And he reaches out to you. Set this in your heart. God loves you. He loves you. 
I think that whole scenario with the washing of the feet and washing of Judas' feet, I think you could hear a pin drop. And this is what verse 12 says, after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You know, when Jesus asks you a question, and I find that I, I ask myself questions from the word of God. And when Jesus asks me a question and there is something obvious about the situation, there's something deeper in the situation. Do you understand what I was doing? I can imagine Peter saying this. Yes, Lord, our job now, our great mission is to wash people's feet. And I'm going out right now buying a hundred buckets and I'm going to have a well. And when people come along, I'm going to wash their feet because that's that's what you want us to do. Is that right, Jesus? Do you understand what I was doing? I can, re- I can imagine Jesus going like this. Peter, Peter, you didn't get this revelation from my Father in heaven. I know this. Because that's not what it's about. It's not about washing feet. When he asks you a question and there's something obvious and you go, well, I know what that is. What is underneath that? He wants us to discover a truth, a principle, a way to live because he is going to leave them with the greatest mission of all the time that there is for mankind. The great mission. Do you know what I'm doing? Do you understand and he says this, verse 13. <coughs> you call me, you call him Lord, and you're right. Because what I am, that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought. That word ought means this. You are obligated. You owe a debt to wash each other's feet. And it's not about washing Feet. Okay. What is it about? Peter is just about to speak again. And Jesus goes, please. Please stop talking. If Jesus is talking to you, Stop talking and listen. Here's the answer. He says, I have given you an example to follow me. Do as I have done to you. And Peter is about to speak. And Jesus looks at him. And Peter goes like this. Listen. What is this all about? He needs to think about it. This is an act of servanthood. This is an act that a slave would do. It's an example to his disciples how they are to treat each other. It is an example for us how we are to treat each other. It is having a self-sacrificing Spirit of humility amongst each other. If the church, excuse me, (coughs) that's right. (coughs) If the church really wants to show what Jesus is like, then this is part of the deal. Self-sacrificing, humility, serving one another, even when your brother is going to betray you. That is tough. I didn't set the example I'm just sharing the example. If you knew that, would you have a spirit of humility, of self-sacrificing, sacrificing one to another? And here's the reality check. This is what Jesus is saying, verse 16. 
I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their masters, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. What Jesus is saying is this, if I do this and I am your Lord and teacher, you should also do this. If I do this, then you should do this. You are not greater than me. You can't get away with not doing this. If I do it, you do it. You serve one another sacrificially with humility. And then people will begin to see the reality of Jesus Christ. And you might say, well, Pastor Jim, I did the Romans 12 motivational test. And servant, being a servant, was right down on the bottom. It's really not for me. That's not what it's talking about. Well, I'm a teacher, I'm a leader, I'm an administrator, I'm a giver, but I'm not a server. You know, servers serve, administrators serve, leaders serve. Listen to this, Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. To serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Even Jesus came to serve. And if he came to serve, and he's my example of how to live life, guess what? I should be serving. I should be serving. It should be who I am to reveal who he is. Now, I understand that sometimes, and in some places, and some churches, and some business, people go beyond what is expected, and they wear themselves out. They wear themselves out in serving. They'll do anything and nearly everything. That's not what it's about. It's about serving out of your gift, Serving one another and being empowered, not being depleted. If you're serving and being depleted, then you should stop serving because your juice is empty. There's no petrol in the tank. Even Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And here's the promise. I have said all that to come to this. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. When I know something and I don't do it, then I'm in the wrong. If I know something, then I have a responsibility to do it. You now have a responsibility to do it because I've told you. You're welcome. I know you're all excited. It's not enough to know what Jesus teaches. We must do what he says. Have you ever heard this? I mean, from a work person, you know, someone you work with or family or friends, they go, all Christians are hypocrites. Has anyone ever heard that? Gee, how did they come to that conclusion? How did that? They're all hypocrites. They're all the same. We're not all the same. I don't want to be the same. A theoretical knowledge is not sufficient unless it transitions into action. Do you hear what I'm saying? You've got to do it. Jesus says, now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. What? Because everybody wants to know. What? What is the blessing? Who wants to be blessed? You better put your hand up because you want to be blessed. Now, often when people interpret the word blessed, and if they have an amplified Bible, it says something like this, to be blessed, to be fortunate, to be envied, to be happy. It does not mean that as in happy. It's got nothing to do with happiness. Nothing about being fortunate, as in when people think fortunate, they think they're going to have money rolling out of their pockets. 
This is the same word, blessed, that's used in the Beatitudes, where Jesus tells us, surprisingly, how to live. How are we to live? Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The word blessed here means this, and you better write this down on the back of the neck of the person in front of you. To be blessed means to have a well-oriented soul. A well-oriented soul. Do you know what that means? It means that your soul is good. It's got nothing to do with external. It's got everything to do with the internal. It is a state of being that is not affected by the outside circumstances of the world. There is a place of being blessed when people will want to say all terrible things about you and despitefully use you where you can stand there and go, God is still on the throne. God is still on the throne. I find this scripture absolutely incredible. This does not mean that we are exempt from trouble in life. Anyone here? had an exemption from the troubles in life since you became a Christian? Who feels like they've got more troubles in their life now that they've become a Christian? Well, you need this. I'm telling you. A well-oriented soul, a soul that's at rest. So when the pressures of life come upon us, we're not freaking out by the external stress. We are empowered by the internal peace that God gives us. This issue of blessedness is derived for resource in the midst of trouble. Do you know what a well-oriented soul is? Now, for me, and this is just me, the soul is the will, the emotions, and the intellect. I don't know about you, but I have found that Pastor Pavey, whenever there's trouble, she gets it in her mind and she just goes crazy about it. Well, sorry, I'm... Did I say you? I meant to say me. When I'm in trouble, what happens in my mind is all these scenarios of what can possibly go wrong. Who has that in their mind? Come on, be honest. Look around. When something bad goes wrong, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, how am I going to do that? Where am I going to get the money from that? What's they going to think? And then you know what happens? My emotions. Oh, I'm so terrible. It's so bad. We'll never get out of this. It's the end of the world. And then you have a look in your bank account and someone's put $100,000 in it. Yes! And you're just like Peter. You're down here and you're up there in an instant. Because our soul, our will, our emotions and our intellect, when, when there's trouble, we break down. But God doesn't want you to break down. He wants to empower you to live life. John 20, verse 31, the reason why we're going through the book of John is this. John 20, 31, put this, get it it written down on a piece of paper in front of you. (laughs) Get thee behind me, Satan. (laughs) But these things are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, you will have life by the power of His name. That's what you need. You've got to get that into your heart. Because when this stuff happens in us, oh, there's a conspiracy, there's this happening, there's that happening, it's the end of the world. My dad told me back in the 80s when I first became a Christian that they're watching us through the television. I said, what? He says, yeah, they're watching us. And I said, they're watching me eat wheat bix with milk and honey and then burping? Is that what they're really interested in? Seriously? It's to take you off the track and worry. God has not given you the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Come on. He wants you. And and this blessed thing that he gives us to orientate our soul, to make us whole in our will and our emotions and our intellect comes through this very act. 
the act of service, sacrificial service. When I do what the word says, and in particular here, to serve one another with humility, I receive a blessing that is manifest in my soul. And there's peace in my soul. I don't know if you've noticed this, but there is a lot of stress and anxiety in our society today. I read a stat that said that kids today are experiencing, this is minors, probably from 13 under, are experiencing the same level of stress that adults faced in the 1950s. Kids, the same level of stress. They're anxious. They're depressed. And I feel for them. Because we have all these external things. You know, I like technology. I do. I like Facebook. I like the computer. But you know, I have found that as I've gotten older, there is more and more information that's coming to me of the things that I should have and the things that I need, the things that I really don't need and the things that I shouldn't have. But there's all this pressure to have these things. And it's pressure, 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 pressure. And all this external stuff is coming on me. And I need to have these things in my life or I won't be whole. I won't be whole. And that's where depression and anxiety and stress, they all fall. That external pressure. But I tell you what, if I do what he says and I serve you, with humility and love, then God pours into my soul a blessedness that is so deep and so strong that internally nothing on the outside can affect it. Do you notice it? That people feel stressed in their emotions in here because of stuff out here. And Jesus is telling us, this is what you want to do. I think he's, he set this up for us. All those external things that we think that we need, goodness, folks, it always leaves you wanting more. It's like a drug addict. We don't realize it. If we serve one another, then we will have strength internally and the external stuff won't matter. Do you know, I don't need a 230 Mercedes Benz don't need it. My flesh might want it, but I don't need it. It's all that type of stuff. Your soul is never satisfied with external things. It always leaves you wanting more. But to serve one another, my goodness, it transforms us to be just like Jesus. What if what if there was a God in heaven who saw man fall by making a mistake? And what if he decided, I'm going to set a plan in motion where they can reconnect to me? And what if I send the son and I show them how to live because the world is going to go absolutely nuts? And they're going to have all this external pressure. What if my son teaches them how to live Life. And that's what he has done. It doesn't work any, any way else. As you give out, he gives in. As you release, you receive. As you sow, you reap. That's the principle of life. And that's it here. Do you think the disciples were in for stressful days ahead? Oh my goodness. Yes, they, they will one day wear masks. That's how stressful it's going to get. No, all these pressures. 
if we just do what he says, we'll have the peace that we need to live this life. That's it. And as I said before, you don't serve to the point of exhaustion, folks. Don't do that. I, as your pastor, I will not allow you to do that. I just won't. You're just not going to do it. Because you're more important than that. You should, yes, use your gift within the church, obviously to serve one another, to serve people in there. But if I see you like, oh, if I pour another cup of tea, I'm going to pour it all over the person that's asked for it. That's prob- you've probably reached the limit there. That means the external is greater than the internal. Okay? Do as he has done, and you will be blessed. Stand with me this morning. What if? What if the things that Jesus told us, what if they would just help us to live life? Serving one another. This is not a plea to get you to serve in church. Take that thought out of your mind completely. Completely. Just close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to just to be honest with yourself and with God. And ask yourself this question. Am I serving with great humility those people that are around me? Am I an example of Jesus Christ? What do I need to do? Holy Spirit, I pray right now for myself, for everyone here this morning, Lord God, that we would truly be servants of the Most High God. Lord, that our souls would sing, Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And I have to make an appeal to you this morning. What do you need to change? Just change one thing. Just change one thing. To serve. Maybe you need to start serving your wife, men. Maybe you need to be serving your husband, wives. Maybe you need to have the right attitude of service in your workplace. What about your family? You know, if we serve one another, my goodness, how wonderful it is. Because as we serve with great humility, God pours in that blessing to give us a well-oriented soul. A soul that is full of goodness. A soul that is stronger than the outside pressures of life. Where our mind and our will and our emotions are secure. Secured in the knowledge that God is with us. And come what may, we can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. And if that's you this morning, I want you to make a promise to yourself that I'm going to begin to serve and serve one another with humility. Serve each other. Even if it's to one who would betray you. That's the the watermark. That's the standard. That's tough. But you know what? I want to be more like Jesus. I just want to be more like Him. I just want people. Just raise your hands right now. I just want to be, if you want to be more like Jesus, just raise your hands now. Father God, release the anointing to the people with their hands raised this morning. I release that anointing, God, to be instruments of Jesus. Father, I pray for 
for your spirit to bring direction to us where we are to serve. We want to be more like Jesus. Great are you, Lord. Jesus, we worship you. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that this morning. Just ask Him to come into your life to be your Lord. You don't have to understand it all, but just say, Jesus, come into my life. If you're watching online, just say, Jesus, come into my life. Fill me, Jesus. Touch me, Jesus. I know that He will do it. I know that He will do it. I, I sense the anointing of God just as we were praying about being more like Jesus. Let that be your heart cry this morning. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to be more like Jesus. 